Hi, thanks for joining us for the Family Plots, Gardening in the Mid-South. I'm Chris Cooper. Weeds, dead leaves, and bugs are bad in the garden. Today we are answering questions about these things and more. It's the Q&A show, just ahead on the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Production funding for the Family Plot, Gardening in the Mid-South is provided by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to the Family Plot. I'm Chris Cooper. Summer is winding down and fall is coming. These past few months, we have received more viewer questions than we can answer on air. So today, we're going to spend the whole show answering questions we got this summer. Let's start off with a question about an unknown plant. This beautiful green plant grows in my yard. It is beautiful, but it takes over. I was hoping you could tell me what type of plant it is. I thought I dug it up by the root last year. It fooled me. This is Shirley. Let's help Shirley out. Yeah, with dog fennel. Dog fennel. Yes, right. it's a common name. It's a eupatorium. Okay. Uh, so, you know, eupatoriums, there's a lot of uh, weeds that are in that family here. And then, I mean, or that genus. And then there's a lot of uh, other uh, perennials that are in that category. So that's why it does so well here. Right, and it actually looks pretty, doesn't it? And, well, yeah, <laughs> the blooms right. on it are very, very small and insignificant, and in so really it's just the foliage you're going to mostly see. Right. Uh, and you don't want to reseed it to reseed and populate the whole area, so, you yeah. know. Yeah, so dog fennel, eupatorium, perennial, depending on where it's sighted, can get three to five feet tall. Yes. Uh, as you can see from that picture, must have liked where it was. Um, if you crush up the leaves, I actually know this, you crush them up, it has like a sour it's not a good you know, smell. smell to it. No, it's <laughs> it not, real, pretty not bad. real pleasant. <laughs> and as it ages, of course, it goes from a you know, fresh, tender stem to a rough and tough, woody uh, stem. So, yes. yeah, dog fennel. Dog fennel. This year, I had a major problem with crabgrass. When should I apply crabgrass preventer to my lung? And this is Steve. Yeah, we have anybody probably crabgrass and everything in there. Yeah. And so and, and, and crabgrass normally time you get when you, when you got uh, you soil it off some kind of way, not healthy. You have and weeds are growing unhealthy soil. Sometimes you need to get that soil test, not the pH and everything. But to put a pre emerge down, you might do you do that in the, in the fall of the year. Then come back again in the spring of the year, put a pre emerge down. Like I said, you need to be activated in with the rainwater irrigation. And you want to cover it in both ways. So put 25 pounds or 50 pounds down. We'll do half one way and half the other way and get a good coverage on there. Mm. Crabgrass can be a problem. Yeah, crab, if be... it were not for crabgrass, I wouldn't have a line. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't say that. Pre-emerge <laughs> is something that you can use, uh, of course. Uh, trifluralin is something that okay. you can use uh, as a pre-emerge. As a post-emerge, uh, quinclorac uh, is something that you can use. Read and follow the label on those. You want to make sure you get good coverage. Uh, when you're using those, crabgrass likes conditions, right, that mm -hmm. are compact. So yep. it likes compact soils okay. and soils that are poorly drained. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's what I have in my lawn. <laughs> uh, so again, make sure that you're following and reading the label. You can control crabgrass. Yeah, I don't like crabgrass. Man. I don't like no weeds in my yard, though, man. I just, I just can't have that weed in there. You know, I go ahead and put that weed out there. Then I see them in there. It's definitely, I try to get all the root system out when you do that. Right, mm -hmm. please do. Yeah. Crabgrass is pretty tough. Pretty tough. I have a nice rolodendron, one of the least tall varieties with dark pink flowers, but nearly every year, one or more large parts of it die. Even though it's over 20 years old, it is still a small shrub. How do I keep parts of my rolodendron from dying every year? And this is Martin. So first of all, he's doing good. Yeah, 20 years yeah, 20 for years one from, rolodendron. Yeah, that's, I, yeah. My hat's off to you yes, because yes, that's, that's, that's hard to do. Yeah. Uh, depending on where, see, we don't know where yeah, he's right, at, right. and so what part of the country you're in, uh, because if you're in a mountainous area, you're probably going to have uh, better luck with uh, growing the rhododendrons right. in your native area. Um, if it's anywhere, even around here in the yes, mid south, it's, tough, it, yeah, it's, it's very, and I see why it, it dies sections every year because. Our soils are not the greatest for it. Right. They like well-drained soil. 
Um, our climate here might be a little warm oh, for yes. them. So, I mean, for the fact that he's had it for 20 years mm -hmm. and it's, it's still going, I, I have, that's great. He's done a very good job. Right. Um, so, but it would be nice to know what part, where, where he sure. lives, so we know what the environment is there and the zone that it is. Right, and then those dying parts, I guess, you know, go ahead and just prune those Oh, definitely out. prune I mean, them off. Yeah, it's, it's not serving the plant any good. Uh, so just keep it fertilized. Keep it and, fertilized. And, right. and keep it healthy, what's there healthy, and like he's done for 20 years. Right. And just enjoy it. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's great. I think that's outstanding. Okay, Martin, yeah, just, uh, you know, do those things, you know, keep the plant as, you know, healthy as possible. And just enjoy it. Yeah. Very good. It's a good job. Yeah, 20 years is good. It's great. Our azaleas have been in our front bed for almost 20 years and once all bloomed together and profusely, but that's not the case anymore. The far left bush hasn't bloomed in a few years, but is always the most brilliant green of them all. The pink bush seems healthy. The middle bush looks mostly dead, but has several white buds, as well as several large white blossoms at the very bottom of the bush. And the white bush on the far right is <laughs> overflowing with blossoms. So what's going on with our azaleas? Okay. This is Doug and Gigi in Bartlett, Tennessee. So it's a lot there, right? Yes, yes. So there's a lot of stuff going on <laughs> right there with that. But uh, overall, with some of those overall, more, okay. yes, right. with some of those more up close pictures that okay. they showed us, I could, even though it wasn't focused in on those particular leaves, I could tell that there was feeding damage from an insect that's called the azalea lace bug. Uh -huh. I'm with you. And yeah. if um, this is left unchecked, it can defoliate, you know, your azaleas mm -hmm. over time mm -hmm. if we have several years of this feeding happening. Now, uh, it appears that the feeding was heaviest on the middle shrub. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and you might say, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why is it only feeding on this one and not the other two? I will say that they are attracted to shrubs that are under stress. Yes. They send out pheromones yes. that say, I'm not doing well, and then the insects yeah, come, come and right. impact things. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that shrub was already on the decline. Maybe there was an issue with pH. You know, mm -hmm. azaleas prefer to have acidic pHs, mm -hmm. and if they're not in that zone, that could be stressful for sure. them. Um, so whatever that, whatever that was, um, that is what is called that defoliation. Now we see the new growth at the base at, of the plant. At the bottom, right. And that's because now light is able to penetrate Good. that canopy. I was gonna mention that. Good. And so they've put up new growth. Mm -hmm. And um, and we see that a lot with you know a lots of different types of uh, woody woody plants. You know, once you uh, prune back some of that um, material, it might look strange and twiggy and sticky for a while, <laughs> but it actually encourages new growth to come out right. on some of that older wood. Right. So I think that's what we're seeing there with the azalea. I would recommend you know treating it with a systemic yeah. insecticide. Okay. Okay to try to get the lace bug under control. I would treat all three. I would too. Because yeah. now that they have feasted <laughs> on the leaves of the one in the middle, they will probably go. Venture out a little bit. Yeah, right. expand their feeding area. Mm. Um, but that, those were the main things that stood out to me. I didn't see any signs of, um, you know, iron deficiency. No, I didn't see that either. Or anything like that, mm -hmm. which is kind of common-ish yeah, with, with azaleas when that, pH range isn't right, it, is. it can't take up the iron that it needs. Yeah. Um, and then we get strange like chlorosis, but the veins are still green. Mm -hmm. It's, it's looks pretty strange, yeah. Yeah, and, then, and like you mentioned before, the light conditions seem to be conducive yes. to growing those azaleas. Yeah. Right. So we're not concerned about that, but yeah, azalea lace bugs, y'all do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad you stress the point of plant stress. Yes. Right. Because again, <laughs> yeah, if those plants are stressed and yeah, they send out those pheromones, right? And some plants actually send up, you know, those, uh, you know, uh, volatile compounds, right? Mm -hmm. The insects can, uh, you know, smell They're attracted and sniff to, out and right? They go right to it. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I think that plants is crazy. are so smart. I think that's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> yeah. So, all right, Doug and Gigi, I think uh, we have your culprit there, right? Yes. All right. So, yeah, we make sure we get those lace bugs under control. You'll be fine. Things should improve. Things should improve. Don't pull, don't pull out the middle shrub. I, <laughs> you know, you might have to put up with the, some strange like proportions for a year yeah, or two, yeah. but I think that'll come back out of it. I have dead spots on this row of trees. Mm -hmm. What is going on? 
What can I do to make my trees healthy again? Diane from Hernando, Mississippi. Ah, so yes. as you can see there, yeah. mm -hmm, look at that mm -hmm. at the top. Yeah, it, it reminds me of bagworms. God, I really, bagworms, really yeah. want to know if she can see them because you should be able to see the mm -hmm. little bags hanging in the trees um, because that would be the, what I would, I've seen that damage before. I have too, and right at the top. That's yeah. usually what it is. BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, is real easy. I've had this problem before and I've put the BT in a, uh, and dialed the rate that I needed oh, for the yeah, yeah, of a okay, garden okay, hose okay. so I could get it up further gotcha. in the tree and, and sprayed BT on a tree that had bagworms and I haven't seen them in two or three years now. Right. Right. So, it, you know, it can be done, uh, That's, but, I, you know, you'll, she'll see them, little bags on the trees to make sure right. that's what that and, is. And the larva is going to be out for those bagworms pretty much in the spring, mm -hmm. right? But after, it, you know, it forms those bags, it's going to be tough to use yeah. any type of insecticide. And it, it, yeah, it so won't. So at that point, if you can reach them, you know, you could take them off. P picking them possibly. off would be really good yeah. at this point. Right. Um, May and yeah, June. This late in, yeah, this May and June, season. when they're actively feeding, is when you want to right. apply the BT. Um, and also, at this point too, it looks bad. So maybe a little fertilizer and, mm -hmm. and TLC mm -hmm. with trying to keep the plants healthy right. will help it grow out of that. Right, right, right. And keep those evergreens watered, please. You yes. know, uh, you know, during any drought-like conditions, they need to be watered for sure. Because if not, they become stressed. And then when those plants become stressed, then guess what? Bugs. Here, here come the bucks. My blueberries, my blackberries, and my gara have patches of burnt dead leaves. Looks like fire blight you would see on an ornamental pear tree. Here in my blueberry plant, the stem was green inside, but the foliage was dry and dead. What is this, and how do I get rid of it? Sally from Germantown, Tennessee. And as you can see there for the pictures, we talked a little bit about this. So what are you thinking? I think we're on the same lines yeah, here. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'd, I'd travel down mm -hmm. a little bit travel and really do some stem mm -hmm. inspection. Right, and I do know, you know, blackberries have stem cankers. Right. So I'm thinking definitely on the blackberry stem canker, blueberries as well. It's, it's a possibility. Yeah, it's yeah. possible. Yeah. Right. Um, and as far as the gara goes, you grow. Yes. Uh, I love my gara. Okay. Um, but I will say that I replace it every couple, three years. It is really sensitive to poor drainage. So I would look at more yes. root rot types of soil drainage issues as kind of a first idea there. Okay. And for those stem cankers, I would probably prune down maybe an inch below there. Yeah. Uh, and I'm saying a good inch. Yeah. Uh, so you can get good green tissue and see what happens uh, from there. Um, you can use a fungicide. I don't know how well yeah. it may work. If we're talking about a small number yeah. of plants. I'll just prune it. Yeah. You know, just prune it out and I think you'd be fine with that. The west side of my house has about one or two hours of sun a day. What shrubs would work in almost total shade? Julia from Lansing, Michigan. Okay. Uh, so let's start. With this, Celeste, let's go to Lansing, Michigan. Okay. Shall we? Yes. Plant hardiness zone, 5B. 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 Okay. So that means that those plants should be able to survive temperatures of negative 10 to negative 15. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So again, that's 5B. Okay, so we've got some options I okay. think that would work um, in those situations. So lots of different types of viburnums mm -hmm. are going to be out there that will grow in zone 5B. Um, and that actually prefer shade. And that prefer shade. Yes. Okay. Good. So viburnums would be an excellent option. Um, some evergreen, some not. Mm -hmm. So make sure mm -hmm. you know when you're looking that we're specifying. You know, you know which species that you're trying to. Okay. Just depends on if you want evergreen or not. Right. Um, Macrophylla hydrangeas. Cool. I believe that might be the top limit <laughs> right to their zone. Okay. So 5B, um, I think, is the limit for the macrophyllas. So that would be an option. You know, they prefer shade. They mm -hmm. do better when they have shade. Mm 
Sometimes the bloom display may be less if you have you know less than four hours of sun, um, but still the plant would be would be a beautiful addition there, just okay. for, even for the leaves if that's all that we were admiring. Right. Um, hollies uh, mm -hmm. are another hollies good option. Good. Hollies uh, can thrive in shade. Mm -hmm. Um, and have a beautiful berry displays. That's right. So yeah, right. you kind of have the, the added benefit there. Um, and then a final one I might throw in would be possibly rhododendrons. And, I you know, so. they like really good drainage. Uh, I know sometimes they prefer higher elevations. Yeah. So, um, you know, just depending on, on what it's like in that particular area. But I think that, I don't think the temperature would be an issue there with right, the rhododendron. Yeah, it would be an issue either. And then for, for other folks, maybe who aren't in, who aren't that high, uh, that far north, a Koopa would be a mm -hmm. great option. Like a it has a smaller um, growing zone. So we're looking at like seven to nine for okay. a Koopa. But it has a really unique leaf. I like the leaf. And yeah. uh, variegation, it's like a light green with yellow splotches all over right. it. And so we can get, um, it's a nice pop in a dark, shady area. Right, right. And this is pretty much, you know, in my estimates, a dark, shady area. Yeah. Area. Yeah, <laughs> one to two hours of sun a day. Um, and something else I'd like to mention too, Miss Julia, make sure you contact your local extension. Yes. Uh, they should have, agent. They, I right. bet they have some wonderful uh, recommendation lists for uh, mm -hmm. landscape, woody landscape plants in your area. I bet you they would. We discovered this tree at the edge of our yard. The trunk you see in the background is the same tree with the fruit. This picture was taken in October of last year. What is it? Thank you, Cameron. So can we help Cameron out with oh, that? Oh, I think we can. <laughs> that is a persimmon, it's a persimmon tree. tree. It's a very nice native tree. Mm -hmm. The animals love yeah. the persimmons. In fact, we can eat those persimmons, mm -hmm. but you make sure they're, they turn orange. Yes, because don't eat too many of them. Yeah. <laughs> get to eat them. You'll find there, there'll be, fair, it's, a, it's a berry because it has more mm. than one seed. And so, um, and there's a lot of uh, persimmons that have been cultivated because of the, this wild persimmon that are more meaty than the, this particular wild persimmon. But okay. you can eat these just as well. Right. So do the animals. Wonderful tree. So it's good for wildlife and for us. Yes, All it right. is. All right, so persimmon tree, yeah, beautiful trunk on persimmon trees. I love it, You yeah. know, as well. Two weeks ago, we filled in plastic pots with new potting soil. Mm -hmm. Now I'm getting what appears to be a fungus and mushrooms. What happened and how should they be treated? This is Danny from Memphis, Tennessee. So can we help Danny out? We help Danny out. All right, Danny, let's help Danny. Him out. I had the same problem Danny had, but uh -huh. not, not, not you know flower pot I had in my in my flower bed. I did too. And that's a slime mold. You see a lot slime of slime mold. mold that get into that fresh organic material. Right. And it begin to fresh, especially fresh organic material. Mm -hmm. it, it, it begin to do that, and it's not causing any harm to the plant and then like that. Cause I had it in my flower bed. And it, it, that's why it don't get hard. It get hard and kind of look look look, look different. Because when I first saw it, I thought, I ain't, I, uh oh, what this is? But but in there, so I, but uh, you can just get your shovel or something, just get it out of there. Yeah, just break right? it, get it out of there. Then turn your soil back over. That's why it, it'll soon go away. But he got slime mold that in the, in that in his flower pot. Slime and, mold. Another name is dog vomit. Dog vomit. Yeah, that, 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 what I thought it was something like that. Yeah. That can grow on mulch. Mm -hmm. You know, I had that in my own landscape. Yeah, but it'll it'll dry up. It'll dry up. Yeah, yeah. And, some, it. and sometimes you don't side on, on going up to, on, get on the plant and then stem and then mm -hmm. but but, it, but it, it do that. But it just slime mold and it's not causing any harm. To right, that. harmless to the plants, mm -hmm. to the pets, and to, to the, us. To us, yeah. The fruit on my dwarf Asian pears have hairy orange spores growing out of some of them. Is it too late to save the rest? And if so, how should I treat it? Any advice would be appreciated. And this is Dan. So we're talking about a dwarf Asian pear, the hairy orange spores. I think we know what that is, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> UT orange, as you usually say. Uh, or, uh, rust. Oh, right. uh, yeah. Rust. Uh, rust. Uh, very, very probably closely related to uh, cedar apple rust mm -hmm. uh, that we commonly see. Uh, spends part of its life cycle on cedar tree and part of its life cycle on, on, an, on the apple. Uh, but it also affects pears and the, the different, the difference between this this uh, Asian pear rust is those spores, the orange, colorful spores, yeah. uh, grow out of the cedar, on on the cedar apple rust, right. and it's manifest on the apple as as uh, bright orange spots on the leaves, 
and, and you don't see that kind of growth coming out of the fruit of the apple. But on this Asian pear rust, uh, you know, it, 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 like the, it's a really volunteer orange. They're really pretty. Yeah, it's, They're it's, really it's, pretty, it's but pretty uh, it really it makes a mess. And, <laughs> and uh, uh, again, just as we mentioned with the uh, with the, the uh, crab apple, crab apple. Uh, follow the uh, the apple and pear spray guide. There's not there aren't many things really labeled for for use on on pears. Mm -hmm. Sulfur. Uh, fungicides, uh, you know, sulfur is yeah. labeled for use mm -hmm. on pears, so that has fungicidal activity, and uh, that might give you a little bit of relief there. Probably uh, the wet spring, that's may have been more of a problem than anything. Um, yeah, that's for sure. I'd be sure that I, you know, gather up all of the affected fruit and you know don't let them fall on mm -hmm. the ground, stay down there, you know, try to try to try to get rid of them. Some of my tomato plants have some top leaves that are light green with a pattern. The older leaves on the plant look fine. What is going on? This is Ella, Arlington, Tennessee. So what do you think is going yeah. on there? So when we see intervenal oh. like that, it certainly takes me in a nutritional okay. direction. I would agree with that. Okay. <laughs> and what are we thinking, yeah. you know, as far as the nutrient? Yeah, so um, so one thing that I would always ask about a, a picture like that is what exactly mm. are they growing this in? So how are they okay. managing the nutrients? Is it soil? Is it soilless? Because uh, I used to work a bit in hydroponics. <laughs> yes, you did. Okay. And sometimes, you know, if the pH gets off or, you know, improper mixing of nutrients, mm -hmm. some things about that picture might make me, you know, think that it could be a, you know, micronutrient as related to pH or solution management. Good deal. And I know you know a little bit <laughs> something about that, but yeah, definitely intervenal. That's what I looked at mm -hmm. first and it kind of just jumped out to me. So yeah, nutrient issue, I would say there. Solution testing. Yeah, maybe. solution yeah. testing, more right? data. Yeah. yeah. I found this bug on my Maximilian sunflower. Is this a good bug or bad bug? I noticed it when I found leaves yellowing. Faye from Brighton, Tennessee. So, nice picture, I like that. So what do we think that is? Good bug, bad bug? I think it's a good bug. I think it's a good bug, okay. I think it's a good bug. So what bug is it? Larval stage of a ladybug. That's what I think it is as well. Yes, oh. and so, you know, it's so important for us to realize that yeah. insects look different during different portions of yeah. their life cycle. And I'm glad that she sent that picture mm -hmm. in because now she knows now that she knows. it's a beneficial insect. Right. Lady beetles are beneficial, they're predatory. So we wanna make sure that we're not doing anything to discourage Good those point. larvae from, um, from doing their thing. And also another stage of the ladybug that's even, looks even more strange than that is um, when it's it's pupating mm -hmm. essentially mm -hmm. and it's like stuck mm -hmm. onto a leaf, on leaf. Mm -hmm. and you're confused, you're like, well, it's not moving, it's like <sighs> suctioned that? on there. So um, yes, definitely do a little investigation when you're when you're trying to identify those insects. Good bug, right? Mm -hmm. Eats a lot of aphids, you know, scales, yeah, beneficial uh, in the garden, our friend. Definitely. Four stages. So you, you did mention a couple of those stages. So you have the egg stage. Yes. The larva, which was there. And the larva looks like an alligator. I was, you know, yeah. talking about, you know it looks scaly. Kind of spiky. Yeah, spiky and scaly, yeah. you know. Pupa, an adult. An adult. So yeah, so you four stages. So there you have it, okay? Thank you for that question and the picture. Mm -hmm. So it's good to know uh, our friends in the garden. And even, let's mention too, that even Asian lady beetles yeah. are predatory. That's right. So, That's right. you know, leave them alone. I have a dozen pollinated flowers on a purple cayenne pepper plant, but the fruits don't grow out of them like before. They don't drop off, they're just pollinated and nothing happens. Why are my cayenne pepper flowers not developing fruits? Shea Constantine on YouTube. So, they're not developing fruits. And this is our cayenne pepper. Right? Yeah, some great yeah. hot peppers. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I would probably tend to kind of look back and think about the general health and productivity okay. of the plant. Yeah. 
So we that. have a self-pollinated okay. pepper. So we're not, you know, going to pollination no. issues or, or something like that. Right. You know, there can be times when the plant, if it's, you know, maybe not in nutritionally great shape, okay. might not be filling out as many fruits. So I would think about things like water, nutrition. That's the thing I think about, okay. You know, health of the plant. If it, you know, if it's, uh, if it's in a pot, you know, we may be stressing the plant to the point where it's not filling out all the flowers that it sets. Okay, but it's interesting, they don't drop off though. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I would say that that is, I mean, that is a little bit surprising. Yeah. Lots of times if the plant is under stress, we will, you know, we'll call it like flower abortion. Yeah, it just or, aborts it. Yeah, yeah, it just drops it off. So it's, yeah, yeah. This whole yeah. question, I was like, yeah, but they don't drop yeah. off. I think that's yeah. interesting. That's in the picture. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we saw a picture, yeah. yeah. Definitely right about that. So yeah, just some uh, maybe, you know, environmental factors, like you mentioned before. Temperature is one, you know. Right. Uh, you know, because... Well, yeah, and of course, when we think about um, the pepper productivity, they are a very warm season. Yes crop and the hot peppers even more resilient against the the warmer conditions so you know it's possible that that it could also be a cool night temperatures. yeah so that's what i'm thinking you know it has been yeah. cool we don't know of course you know this question yeah. is but yeah. yeah it's been a cooler spring into summer yeah. so even for us in the mid south yeah, even, it's yeah, been cool here. so sure. potentially in in northern regions and sometimes way too hot or way too cool at night can interfere with pollination as well remember we love to hear from you. Send us an email or letter. The email address is familyplot at wkno.org and the mailing address is familyplot7151 Cherry Farms Road, Cordova, Tennessee 38016. Or you can go online to familyplotgarden.com. That's all we have time for today. To get more information on any of the questions we answered this week, go to familyplotgarden.com. We have all these questions listed on the home page. We also have over a thousand videos about the garden. Thanks for watching and keep sending in the questions. I'm Chris Cooper. Be sure to join us next week for the family plot, Gardening in the Mid-South. Be safe.